Hi, I'm Dean Pello, and I'm graduating from Goddard Middle School, heading to GHS. Hi everyone, my name is Kezia. I am homeschooled through Sky Mountain Charter School, and I'm graduating from eighth grade to high school. Hi, I'm Joshua Hurley, I'm graduating high school from Barossa Academy. Hi, my name is Clarissa, and I'm graduating from Rio Hondo Prep. Next year, I will be attending Pasadena City College, and then I plan to transfer to Wilco Cal State, where I will major in liberal studies and minor doctorate. Hey, Fiddle Church! My name is Grace Lewis, and I'm graduating high school from the Well Trained Mind Academy. Hi, I'm Corey, and I'm graduating from Glendora High. Hi, Impact! It's Leah Emanuele. This year, I will be graduating from Glendora High School, and I'm heading off to Cal State Fullerton, and I'm most excited to use their library. Hi, Foothill! My name is Chloe Carrasco, and I'm graduating from Covina High School, and I'm going to Cal Poly Pomona to study pre-veterinary medicine. Hi, my name is Alfredo. I graduated from San Jose State University with a Bachelor of Arts in Design Studies, emphasizing in graphic design. Hi guys, my name is Tucker Lewis and I'm graduating from Liberty University Online with a Bachelor's in Worship Studies. Hey fellow church family, my name is Pedro and I'll be graduating with my Bachelor's in Accounting and I'm out of hospitality from Cal Poly Pomona. What's up Foothill Church, this is Duma here. I graduate with a Master's in Computer Information System from Colorado State University. Hi, my name is Bailey Borello. I graduated from Azusa Pacific University with a Master's in College Counseling and Student Development. Well, happy Sunday, Fiddle Church, and congratulations to our graduates. We're so uh, glad for you. I know it's been a weird time, but, uh, but congratulations to you anyways, and, and hope the Lord blesses you in your future ventures. Listen, we're here to worship. Uh, we're gathering all across this area to come together and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to just do me something right now. Just stand with me, all right, and let's, let's do this together. Let's kind of get our full bodies into this, and remember, we're not here. Just this is not time to sip coffee and watch TV. This is a time for us to spend this hour and 15 minutes really focusing on our worship of Jesus Christ. So as you do that, uh, maybe just extend your hands uh, towards us and we'll extend ours towards you and, uh, and we'll pray for you right now, okay? Let's, let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you and we ask that, Lord, you just settle in upon our time together, that, Lord, you'd be glorified in all that happens in the preaching of the word and the worship. And, Lord, tune our hearts, as the, as the hymn says, to sing your praise this morning, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. No 
Great promise. God brings us joy, and uh, and we see His heart. God, He He just loves us. He wants to be with us. He wants to help us. And uh, what a great thing for us to be reminded of as we come to Him in prayer this morning. Let me just remind you, uh, if you're new this morning, we have this number uh, on the screen: six two six four six nine seventy seventy. If you'll, you'll text, anybody can text in a prayer request and just know that there are people on the other side of that, right? This is not a robot answering a machine. We would, we would love to be able to answer uh, those and pray with you and for you. And so please let us know how we can be praying for you. But I'd love us to just be praying together as a congregation. And so maybe right where you are, if you would, uh, maybe, maybe you're at home as a family and, and you can just sort of huddle up around together, grab somebody's hand. And, and let's pray for this. I, I really feel like in this day, and age, and we'll talk about this even today in the sermon, but we need in this moment just congregational unity, right, that God would keep us together, and then, and then we need wisdom, right, and, and um, uh, that God would grant us wisdom on when and how to reopen the church and our services and all that in line with what the, what, the, what the state of California and local officials and all of that are saying. And so would you just pray for that? Would you just call on God and say, God, keep our hearts unified, and Lord, help us that you'd give leaders and others wisdom to know how we go forward in reopening our service. Okay, let's just take about a minute, and, uh, and we'll pray together, all right? Bow your heads. Let's pray.
but if you're tuning in for the first time, it's called Is He Worthy? And it comes with a call and response. So I will sing the question, do you feel the world is broken? And with one voice, you, church, and Sally will answer with, we do. And then we will all come together for the choruses and sing them together.
intend to dwell again with us. This is the good news, he does. even in the midst of these trials and tribulations that you are putting us through. God, I pray that you would still move today. Show us how worthy you are. Break our hearts so that we may glorify and worship you even better than we can, than we have before. Lord, I pray that even as we dive into scripture with the sermon, that you would move Draw us closely to you and bless the words that Pastor Chris is going to bring for us today. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen. Run for Their Lives has never been about the course, the t-shirts, the medals, or the prizes. Run for Their Lives exists for one reason, for them. And the way to fight sexual exploitation begins with you. On June 6th, you can walk for freedom, run for justice, and raise your arms for victims of exploitation wherever you are. For $24, you can bring freedom. Will you run for their lives on June 6th? Well, Foothill Church, one of the things that we have supported for about the last six years uh, going is Run For Their Lives. You saw this video, and because of COVID-19, uh, we won't be having the, the actual race, but we're going to do a virtual race and encourage you to go out and run, get some exercise uh, on June 6th, and um, uh, you can still register for that. And again, just remember, uh, all of this money goes towards fighting of sex trafficking and supporting actually a home uh, for women who have been sex trafficked and re rescued out of that. And so, man, we want to raise as much money as we can. So go to foothill.church slash run. You can sign up there. Um, and, uh, and I think it's $25 or so for, for you to do that. And, uh, and we'll, we'll end up raising uh, some money for them. So, so go there right now and, uh, and register for that. We'd love to have as many people as possible involved in, uh, in fighting this uh, in our culture, okay? 
All right, well, if you're new today, Foothill Church exists to glorify God by leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ rooted in the gospel. That kind of describes everything that we wanna be pursuing, everything that we're about. And so it all pertains to the gospel. And so, man, we're, we're glad you're here. And man, if that sounds like, hey, that resonates with my heart, then we, enjoy, we, we invite you, man, join us on this mission. Join us to see more people uh, growing in their relationship with Jesus Christ, more people understanding and growing uh, in the gospel. We'd love for you to join us in that. Uh, and if you are new, uh, uh, then just know in, a, I think, a, a, a couple weeks from now, on the first uh, Sunday of the month, we're going to be holding, June 7th, we're going to be holding our Foothill 101 class. This is part of a three-class process called Growth Track. And uh, all you need to know is if you've not done 101, if you're kind of wondering, hey, who is Foothill Church? What are they about? What makes them tick? That kind of thing. Then you want to sign up for this class. We'll do it via Zoom. And uh, there's been a couple, few dozen people that have done it these last few weeks. And we'd love for you uh, to be involved in that. And so uh, you can go to, you can, you can even text us right now, just text uh, 101 or Foothill 101 to 626-469-7070 and we would, we would love to get you involved. You do need to sign up uh, just so we can send you the Zoom link, but we really would invite you and encourage you to do that if you want to explore what Foothill Church is, is about. And then, of course, you can use the, the 626-469-7070 number for, for more than that. Uh, in fact, we would love to know if you are new today, just text back and say, I'm new. Um, you can, you, we're, we're going to send you just what we would normally have as a connection card in, our, in the seat backs here at the, at the church. Uh, we'll send you a virtual connection card, just our way of getting to know you a little bit. We're not going to pester you, bother you, but we do have a gift we'd love to send to you. And, um, and I think you'll enjoy it. So if you'll, if you'll text 626-469-7070, let us know, uh, then we will, we will uh, get you signed up. We'd love to know that you, you came today. All right. All right, well, if you uh, would grab your phones or grab your, uh, your computer or whatever, your laptop, um, I want to invite you. This is a time when we're going to give. And I want to thank you, first of all, for your generosity these last, what, 11 weeks now that you have given and you've given generously. We've, we've met our budget, and uh, that's because of your faithfulness in that. And I just want to challenge you today. A couple ways you can give. First of all, you can give through uh, online at foothill.church slash give, or you can give on our Foothill Church app. That's how Michelle and I do it, and, um, and it's a very simple simple, easy way. If you've got the app, there's a lot of other uh, information on there uh, as well. So let me challenge you. Um, you know, in, in Malachi chapter 3, this is one of those things that years and years ago, I remember hearing this passage and, and it just challenging me. And I'll just say this, it has set the course for my wife and I in terms of how we view our money, and well, God's money, and giving back to Him. Malachi chapter 3 says this. Let me just read it to you. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your father, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? And he says, here's how you return. Will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that you may, there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer over you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear fruit, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I'll just say this, that years ago, I just decided, man, I want, I want the Lord to be in the midst of my finances. This is not a promise of wealth. This is a promise God says, I'm gonna be with you. If you will, the way you return to God, for many of us, right? We'd say we're believers, but we have not turned our hearts because our, our pocketbook is not turned there. And I wanna just challenge you. That you'd say, man, the first thing, so what Michelle and I do, the very first thing we do after we're paid is we give. We wanna make sure that God gets the first fruits. We give, we give somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 13% of our income because of our gross income because we want God to have the very, best of what we have to offer. Now, you, you may not be there. I'm just saying that's where we are. But you would say, man, I'm going to put the Lord first. And he says, man, test me. It's one of the only places. There's a couple of places where God says this, but he says here, test me and see if I won't bless you. Test me and see if I will not destroy the devourer, those things that sort of seem to just sort of eat away at your finances. Put God first. Invite him into your finances, as many of you have done. So 
Now, this isn't for everybody, but for some of you that would hear this and say, man, that's something that I failed to do, and I want to do that. I, I pray that God would challenge each of our hearts, especially in a day like this, that we would give and we would give generously and sacrificially uh, for the sake of his kingdom, for the good of our souls, for the, the advancement of what God wants to do in the world. All right, let's pray together. Father, we love you and we thank you and we pray, God, now as we give back to you just a small portion of what you've given us, that you take it, that you'd bless it, and that you'd be glorified in all that we use it for, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. If you grab your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to make it through verses 11 through 17. And as you're turning there, let me just congratulate. We've already congratulated our graduates, but also want to congratulate uh, Corinne Carrera and Jay Brooks on their engagement. I believe it was last week. And so congratulations to them. Again, just so thrilled to see that wonderful life events like this are still happening in the midst of this crazy uh, time that we're going through. So congratulations. Uh, to Jay and Corinne. Uh, well, uh, uh, Duana Gurley is, is coming and she's going to be reading for us the scriptures from 1 Peter chapter 2. So Duana, come and read for us. Good morning, Foothill Church. Today's scripture is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. This is God's word. All right, thank you, Duena. Um, one of our covenant partners here at Fiddle Church and her husband, Patrick, just a wonderful family. Uh, and let's get started in, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 11. So I think... I think it's a universal experience that we all go through where we find ourselves in a situation at an event or something and we, we feel like we just don't belong. We feel out of place, right? So, so it could be I, you show up at what you think is a formal event uh, and uh, you're, you're wearing the tuxedo, everybody else is wearing shorts or vice versa. Or you show up to uh, an office party. You don't know any of the people that your spouse has invited you with and so you, you find yourself sort over, over in a corner going, man, these are not my people. I don't feel like I belong here. I heard Jerry Seinfeld mention one time that, that when he goes to a party, the, he, he tries to find another comedian because until he does, he feels very, very out of place. Like he doesn't have anybody to talk to until he can relate to another comedian. Right, this would be the, you know, all stereotypes and things here, but this would be the sort of deep-souled artist who finds himself in a room full of face-painted sports fanatics. That this would be the this would this would be the blue collar or white collar worker in a room with the opposite, where you just feel like I, I don't feel in place. I feel like I don't belong here. I think everybody feels this way. And that's a pretty good description of the Christian life. Right, there's a sense in which we, we feel like we don't belong. We feel out of place. We, we feel like there's something missing, like there's some sort of like, I, I feel strange. I feel, I feel alienated from the culture. That's, that's actually a good thing. There is some of that that we ought to feel. 
But why do we feel that way? Because our whole identity has changed. All the old things that we look to to give us our identity, our, our, our race, our ethnicity, our occupation, all these things have sort of gone by the way. Now we're told that we serve a new king. We have a new father. This new king is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He transcends every other earthly power, every other lord, every other king, president, prime minister, any authority takes second place to him. So, because we have this new king, we have this new identity, we feel out of place. We feel like we're not at home. Like, you ever feel this? Like, we ought to. There ought to be a sense in which sometimes we're watching the news cycle, we're listening to politicians and think, wait a second, that doesn't jive with where I am. There ought to be times when we feel like our lives are running perpendicular or against the grain of the culture. There ought to be times when we hear the Hollywood or cultural elite and things that are being espoused and think, wait a second, I am 180 degrees different than where they are. Not because we're being jerks, but because there's something fundamentally different. See, if we are a a, a chosen race, a, a holy nation, a priesthood, a people for God's own possession, as we learned last week in chapter two, then something shifted. If that's who we are, and we said this is about our, that was about our identity, here's who you are because of Jesus Christ, then what does that mean for our behavior? How do we live in light of that? And Peter's going to tell us today there's really two broad ways we'll live, and I'll show you the subheadings underneath, but he's going to say we should live as strangers and we should live as citizens, okay? So we'll look at each of these in turn. First of all, he's going to say we ought to, in light of our new identity, live as strangers. Look at how he says this. Go to chapter 2 and look at verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. There it is. When Peter opened in chapter 1, verse 1, he, he addressed it to the exiles in these different areas. He says, we are different. We are strangers. We are aliens. But he uses two words. He uses the word sojourner and exile. So what's a sojourner? We don't use that term very often. A sojourner would be somebody in our parlance. We'd say, you know, they're from a foreign country, but they have a green card or a long-term visa, something like that, right? They, They hold a passport in that country, but they happen to have lived here for a while. An exile is somebody who's more of like a temporary. He doesn't mean literally they've been grabbed by a foreign power and stuck in another place. That that would be Babylonian type of exile of the Israelites. But he does say, look, you find yourself temporarily living in a different place. What's Peter's point? What he's saying when he calls us sojourners and exiles is that as Christians, we recognize we don't belong here, right? We feel out of place. We look at our lives, we look at this place and say, this is not our home. So what? So what does that mean? So we don't make ourselves at home. We, we, we have reasonable expectations about what that means for us, which means we're probably, very few of us are gonna hold positions of power and privilege and prestige. That's just not gonna be us because this is, we're, we're, we're out of step, if you will. We're, we're marching to the beat of a different drummer. We're serving a different king. We're holding to different values. It makes us feel like strangers, like aliens. Okay, so, so if that's true, verse 11, how do we live that way? How do we live as strangers and aliens and yet faithfully to God? Okay, well, Peter keeps going, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest what he's going to tell us is that we should fight aggressively. Now watch this, because I want to make sure you hear me and don't misunderstand me. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of your flesh which wage war against your soul. So what I don't mean is that we fight aggressively against the culture. Right? No, he's not saying that. He's saying we fight aggressively against those things that wage war against us, right? That, 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 that wage war against our soul. So, so as he talks about them in terms of what he calls passions of the flesh. That, 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 word, that word passion 
uh, is very often in scripture translated as the word lust. It's a, actually a compound word in Greek with two words that are sort of smished together, one meaning over and the other meaning desire. Put them together, over desire. A, a desire that might have been good that has become ultimate. I mean, saying to, to go, go after those kind of ultimate desires that, that wage war against your soul, these soul-destroying sins, these all-consuming things, these things that look and, 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 and they take away, they can, they can rob us of what God has for us, not only here, but for eternity. So, I mean, think about this. Peter is not saying um, that, that we should abstain from any kind of fleshly pleasure. Food is pleasurable, but food can become a passion, an over-desire when what? It turns to gluttony. Sleep can be a pleasure. Taking a nap in the middle of the afternoon can be a pleasure, but it can become uh, a sin, an over-desire when it becomes laziness. Sex can be a pleasure, but it can become a god when it turns into sexual immorality. Right, so, so this is the idea, wage war against those. Now Paul, Paul talks about them and he uses almost the same exact terminology. He calls them in Galatians 9 or 5, he calls them the deeds of the flesh. So if you recall uh, Galatians 5, verse 19, he gives us 15 things. He said, let me give you an example. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things, that word do means practice such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. What's happening here? He's saying there are these, uh, we could say some are mental sins, you know, it's envious, it's sort of internal sins. Some are external, drunkenness and, you know, sexual morality, mental, physical, all of them are sin. Paul says, and Peter echoes, and says, abstain. Do not let these be things. There should be a zero tolerance policy for deeds of the flesh, which is why Paul talks about putting to death the deeds of the flesh. We mortify, as the old Puritans used to say, we, used to, we mortify the deeds of the flesh. We, we go against it. So this is what I mean when I say we fight aggressively. I'm not fighting the culture. I'm fighting besetting sin. That ought to be what I wage war because it's waging war against me, okay? That's the first way we live as strangers. Nobody does this. This is why it's such a strange thing to do. Wage war against the impulses, the sinful impulse of your life. That's a distinctly Christian thing to do. But the second thing under living as strangers is he says, he says, how do we do this? We, by living beautifully. Now, let me show you where I get this. I think this is really a key to the whole passage. Verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Now, by the way, he's writing the Gentiles. So it's kind of odd. He's saying you, you should already see yourself as different from those you come from. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your, de your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Okay, so keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Now, why do I say this is living beautiful? That phrase, keep your conduct honorable, literally could be translated having beautiful, having a beautiful lifestyle. Okay, the, the, the word there that is translated honorable um, is a word that is almost always translated attractive or beautiful. And the word conduct is one of Peter's favorite terms. I think he uses it 13 times in first and second Peter combined. But it's the way he wants to talk about our lifestyle, our Christian lifestyle. So he says, man, your lifestyle, what people see ought to be beautiful. Now, what's the context for beautiful living in 1 Peter chapter 2? Because this is key, right? I mean, we could talk about what does it mean to live beautifully? Oh, it could be the way I take care of my kids. Very true. It could be the way we engage in political discourse. Absolutely. It could be all kinds of things. But Peter says, I want you to see it in one particular arena uh, in, in particular. And look at how he says this. Verse, verse 12, he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak evil of you as evildoers, 
It's in the context. He says, I want you to live beautifully in the midst of slander, of people speaking evil of you. And notice it's not if they will, but when they will. I, I hope you understand that that we live in a culture, every Christian of every age has lived in a culture where there are those who are hostile to us, that, that will speak evil, that will say, I can't believe you're as exclusive as you are. I can't believe you'd say in a, in a pluralistic world there is one God and that one God represented in Jesus Christ. I can't believe you'd say Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life. We will be maligned for that. We will be called evil for holding to biblical sexual ethics. People will say you're backwards, you're behind the times. When we hold up the sanctity of life, when we don't adopt the mores of our culture, people will look at that and say that's evil and we'll be slandered for it. But this is nothing new. Like this has happened since the beginning of Christianity. You understand, um, the culture will latch onto elements of the truth and then exploit them. So, so for the early Christians, they would get together, they'd participate in the Lord's Supper, which we will do here in a moment, right? And what would they hear? They'd say, this is the body this is the blood. And so early Romans accused the Christians of being cannibals. I mean, you can see the headlines, right? Christians eat bodies. Christians drink blood. It's not true, is it? The we're going to be spoken evil of. We were called, early Christians were called atheists. Now, now we use that as somebody who doesn't believe in God at all. They use that term to describe people that didn't believe in the pantheon of the Roman gods. Rather, they believed in one God. You're atheists because you don't adopt our gods. Christians were called haters of humanity because they refused to go to places where foreign deities and local deities were worshiped. We will not, we cannot, we must not bow our knees to any of your gods. And so what happened? Well, you're haters. You don't follow along with us. You wanna, you wanna be different than the community. Listen, when when we're called haters of humanity because we will not bow the knee to the gods of our age, then slander is inevitable. But how do we respond, right? How, 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 what, what do we do? Does Peter say retaliate? He says live beautifully so that the culture doesn't have a leg to stand on. So that there's any accusation will never actually hold water if they'll investigate it. So what does it look like? What, again, what is a beautiful life? What is beautiful uh, 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 citizenry and strangers? What does that look like? Well, again, we could talk about it. Go, we, we just went through uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, and we got to chapter 4 and, and, and Paul says, uh, aspire to live quiet and peaceable lives. We could talk about it again in terms of what it looks like in our public discourse, all kinds of ways. You could say it looks like being like Christ, but here's Peter and he's gonna say what that looks like to live honorably in the midst of this godless culture. He goes on to say it looks like living as citizens, okay? So look at verse 13 with me. He says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors sent by him to punish those who do evil, to praise those who do good, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Let's just stop there for a second. See, see if you're reading a Bible like I am, I'm, I'm reading the English Standard Version and, and there's like a, there's, you know, it goes to verse, uh, verse 12 and there's a, paragraph and there's a new heading over verse 13. That's not how Peter would have written it. Peter wants you to see that one of the ways your beautiful life plays out is in our citizenry. Wherever we find ourselves, we're supposed to behave as good citizens. Now, I want you to, we haven't talked about this before, but this is a remarkable thing that Peter says this. Because Peter is writing to Christians who would find themselves within the Roman Empire. Okay, 
And the emperor at the time of Peter's writing is a guy that many of you know from history as Nero. And Nero was a madman. And Nero did crazy things. Right? Nero's the one who, one of them, who set himself up as a god and actually required worship. And if you didn't worship, you died. Nero's the same one that murdered two of his wives. Nero is the one who some scholars believe actually helped set the fires in Rome in July of 64 and then blamed Christians and then stuck them on posts and lit them on fire as human torches. This is Nero. And Peter says to people living under that, be subject to the authorities. How do we live as beautiful citizens? Well, verses 13 to 15, by submitting to authorities. You see that? I mean, it's plain as day. Be subject. Now, we're Americans, most of us listening. And we hate submission and we hate feeling like we're subject. We like revolution. We like individual rights. We like our freedoms. But submission here simply means you are arranging your life under the authority or guidance of another. You look and you say, okay, I'm going to, I have to come under these authorities. And notice the scope of that authority. Look at verse 13 again. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Not, they believe like me, they're all Christians there, I like these guys, I don't. To every single human institution. Why? He says, for the Lord's sake. See, let let me say two things about this. In other words, you're now citizens of another place. The Lord reigns. He's the Lord of your life. Now, bring the values of that other country into this country. Live that way for the Lord's sake. But also, because we as Christians, you understand your Bible teaches in many ways that there is no authority in heaven or earth that has not been ordained by God. Every single one. There is no president, no premier, no prime minister, no governor, no mayor, no city council, no, no, no water deputy, no inspector that does not exist, that exists outside of, of God's ordaining them. This does not mean that God is pleased with what they do. But in his divine purposes, he is accomplishing something and has set them up. He says, you submit to them. You be subject to them for the Lord's sake. You're submitting to God in that. He's ordained them. When you you resist them, you resist God. Now, I think this is incredibly practical. I didn't plan this. Uh, but like so often happens as we just walk through Scripture, it seems to coincide with where we are as a church and as a culture. So here we are. I think the last time we met as a church was March 8th. Like, like that's hard to believe. Like, like April and May are about to become like the Avengers blip, right? It's like how did this happen? Where did the time go? And it's 11 weeks into this and we're staying at home and we're wearing masks and we're sanitizing hands and we've been told by our governor we must stay home and, and, and local authorities saying we, we can't open up business yet. All these kinds of things are happening and we're getting impatient and we're getting upset. And we're like, when are they gonna finally blow the doors open? And some are beginning to cry constitutional crisis and others are beginning to say discrimination and others are saying persecution. This is what's going on. What is our response? How do we look at that? See, can a governor say, you have to stay at home? And can, is this a time when we as Christians should say, wait a second. No. We're supposed to be in church. And we protest. And we start to cry foul. 
and maybe a time for civil disobedience. Is that what we should be doing? See, see here's the thing. We, we may not like the order given by a governor, a emperor, a president, a local official, right? We may disagree with the closing of churches, but are we therefore free to disobey? Let, let, me, let me give you what would be kind of how the Bible speaks about civil disobedience. Okay, if I were to say, what, what, is the, what is the big idea for civil disobedience in the Bible? Jonathan Lehman, I think, said it best. He said, civil, he said, civil disobedience is biblically justified when, now get this, the government forbids something the Bible commands or commands something the Bible forbids. Okay, you gotta keep this definition in your head. This is exactly right. So, so, so we could trace this through Scripture. Okay, you could, go, you could go to Daniel. Daniel, you must not pray. In fact, we're gonna enact a law that says, Daniel, you can't pray anymore. What does Daniel do? He kneels down just like he does. He opens the windows and he begins to pray to the God of heaven and he's arrested for it and thrown into a lion's den. We could go to the New Testament and you'd see Peter, you'd see Paul, you'd see, hear them saying, listen, if you tell us not to preach the gospel, we must obey God rather than men. And so we, we have to do this. We, we can't disobey what God has asked us to do. So, so let's say it this way. When the government, Foothill, says to us or any other church, you are now legally forbidden from meeting as a church in order to exercise your religion or to preach the gospel, and we are going to single you out, and we're going to require that you not worship Jesus, and you cannot preach the gospel, then you know what we'll do? we will meet and we will preach the gospel. When they say it is no longer acceptable in our culture for you to preach the ethics of scripture, we say we will preach the ethics of scripture. You see this? This is, this is, this is we're gonna have to say we, we, we obey God rather than men. Now let me be clear, right? What we don't do is start a revolution. What we don't do is march on a capital. What we don't do is get angry and throw rocks. No one in the Bible ever does that, even in response to, to a government saying, you cannot preach, you cannot teach, you cannot say certain things. Um, in fact, uh, you're gonna see in scripture, if they throw Paul in jail, what does he do? He just starts a jail ministry. He's gonna to say to the Philippians, I want you to know that what happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What, what has happened to Paul in Philippians? He's talking about his imprisonment. So that even those of the imperial guard have heard, Caesar's household, have heard that I was in prison for Christ. And most of the brothers, he goes on to say, have become, have become much more confident by my imprison to speak the word without fear, with boldness. Paul goes, this is exactly what God wants. There are people who will be reached because we, we, there was a, some civil disobedience. I preached even though I wasn't supposed to. I was put in jail. I didn't protest. And, and look what happened. See, Christian, the posture is faithful presence in a sinful world, proclaiming the gospel even if we're punished. That's the biblical pattern. Now hear me very clearly. We're not being asked to do that. This is not the situation we're in. This is not a situation where they have said, all the churches, Gavin Newsom did not stand up, declare a state of emergency and say the only people that can't meet are Christians and churches. This is not a place where we're being singled out. This is something where, where Gavin Newsom, by constitutional authority, and by the way, by the constitution of, of all 50 states in our union, can declare a state emergency for the protection of the society that he governs, and it's for the greater good. Now listen, even if I don't agree with it, even if I think he's wrong, he didn't say, 
only churches can't open their doors. This is not persecution. This is an attempt at preservation. And, and, and look, the biblical position doesn't change even if Gavin Newsom's orders are wrong-headed or scientifically unwarranted. They might be. They might be. But we're still called to obey. Look, you can, you, you can say, and listen, I sympathize with this. You can sit there and say, this is nonsense. This is crazy. I don't believe the science. I'm not infected with COVID-19. I'm not going to infect anybody else. I should be able to do what I want, how I want. And you might be right. But you cannot defy the government and remain biblically faithful. So we don't say, and we will not say, Foothill, that we will meet no matter what. The government can't stop us. No, we will meet. So let me just say this. Let me give you a rubric of what we're going to look at. We will meet when it's legal. See, maybe a constitutional crisis will come, but it's not right now. We're going to meet when it's legal, when it's safe, and therefore, by the way, loving, and when it's practical. Legal. Legal. The powers that be have said to businesses and churches and others, okay, the doors can open. It's safe. We can manage that within our environment. We can, we can staff it. We can make sure we, we're, not, we're not doing this out of fear. We told you from the very beginning, our doors aren't closed out of fear. They're closed out of love. We don't want, we don't want this to be a place people come in and get infected. But we're also going to do it when it's practical. See, I think some of you think that all we got to do is hear the, uh, the, the, the doors are open and you're free to go back to church and boom, we could have church tomorrow. Do you, do you realize what if they say you can have church tomorrow, but here's 57 boxes you must tick in order to have church? I think a lot of you would be excited to come back. About, in fact, the survey you took, about 70 to 80% of you are excited to come back. So am I. I just want to help you understand what that means. What will church look like if it's you sitting six feet from everybody else and singing worship with masks on and not being able to touch each other and you can't come forward for prayer and we can't pass communion or we can't pass an offering plate and congregational singing is muffled and all these kind of things. Plus, what do we do about bathrooms and how do we staff and volunteer that? How do we get, what do we do with children? They got to come with us. And I think some of you would be like, well, I'm coming no matter what. I think you would. And I think in about four weeks, I'd be preaching to an empty sanctuary again. So when it's legal, when it's safe and therefore loving, and when it's practical, that there's nothing unbiblical about that. So we're not going to say we will meet no matter what. We won't join the groups of churches that have said things like that. We, we, we will obey those in authority. We'll be subject to every human institution because what? We don't want to give, I'm going to use Peter's language here, we're not giving people a reason to speak evil of us. They already have enough things. They already have things that they think they know about us that would make them speak evil about us. Let's not give them ammunition they don't need. So we live quiet and peaceful lives when we pray for those in authority over us. I mean, seriously, have you prayed for Gavin Newsom? Or are you just too mad at him? Have you prayed for Donald Trump? Are you just too mad at him? Romans chapter 13, Paul says uh, to us to, to submit to governors and to kings. And you can say that's unconstitutional. And I would say in response to that, from a biblical footing, that's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Whether it's unconstitutional or not is irrelevant. When we're told to do something by the authorities that doesn't violate a biblical command, that doesn't tell us to do something the Bible forbids or to not do something the Bible commands and it's done for the good of society, we obey. Now, some of you would say, oh, but Chris, the Bible says to not neglect the assembly of the people together, that we are, we are required to come together. And I believe that, but hear me, do not use that excuse. Don't come and say that to me as your excuse if you're one of those who say, when the doors open, I tend to come to church about one every five weeks. 
That isn't a, a way for you to escape what's happening with the government because you don't like where it is now when you're the very person that would say, when these doors open, I'll be about as faithful as a, as a, a few times a year. You say, man, I'm there every Sunday. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. But this is not discrimination. Richard Baxter lived in the 1600s. He was a Puritan, probably talking about the plague. Listen to what he says here, because I think this is dead on. If a magistrate asks you to refrain from meeting because of a pestilence, this is the 1600s, you do not meet. On the other hand, if the magistrate tries to force you not to meet because of persecution of Christianity, you meet anyways. That's the dividing line. And that's not where we are right now. See, I don't have to like what our government says to obey what our government says. I don't like that there's a stop sign at the corner near my house, but I stop there every time. There's a lot of things you and I don't like, and yet we obey. All right, enough of that, but I want you to see this. This is, this is where we are. Right? We live as good citizens by submitting to authorities even when we don't like it. I imagine Paul and Peter and Jesus and the apostles, there were all kinds of things they were required to do as citizens of Rome. But they'd say, I don't like this law. But they submitted to it. Be subject to authorities. Next, look at what he says in verse 16. He says, we, we, we live as citizens by living freely. So look, he wants to remind us and say, okay, so live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but as living as servants of God. So I don't say, well, I'm free and Jesus is my king, so now I can do whatever I want in this society. No, you're free from sin. You're free from bondage. You're free from law. You're free from the death, from, from, from death, right? You're, you're free from all that, but you are still, Paul's gonna tell us in Romans, you're still slaves of God. And as slaves of God, we don't abuse our freedom for the sake of sin. See, there is a limiter, Christian, on our freedom. It is not unbridled license. And the limiter on our freedom is loving God and loving our neighbor. See, Jesus didn't set us free for self-indulgence. He didn't set us free for radical American individualism and protest. He set us free so that we'd love. He'd set us free to be an army of compassion and grace and mercy and forgiveness. To live as good citizens. So again... We're not doing church online because we like it. We're not doing it out of fear. We're doing it because the authorities have told us to and because we love people and don't want this to be a place where they're harmed. Then lastly, he says, we live as citizens by honoring everyone, even the emperor. This is remarkable that Paul says this, right? Verse 17, honor everyone. This, this, this word honor, by the way, means respect them. You don't, you don't have to love what they do. You respect them, right? You honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, that is other believers. Fear God, worship God. Don't worship another person. Honor the emperor, Nero. Respect him. Respect the power that has been given to him, as Paul's just mentioned, right? He gives governors, he gives emperors, verse 14, to punish those who do evil, to praise those who do good. That's, that's the ordination that God has upon them. Whether they carry it out as God commands is between them and God. But he says you honor them even the emperor, even those you disagree with, even those who are hostile toward us, even those who might work at cross purposes with Christianity. That's, that ought to rebuke most people that are hearing this because we are a low honor culture and I bet very few of us would say we respect, now fill in your least favorite politician's name here. I don't respect that guy. I don't respect that gal. They don't deserve my respect. They don't deserve my honor. That's how we talk. That's fine. That's just not biblical. See, 
Here's what Peter's saying. When you do this, when you live like, you see how countercultural this is? When you live like this, we will silent slander and we will live beautiful lives. It's amazing. Let's pray. So, Father, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for the wisdom that Bible, the Bible gives us, for the practicality of even where we find ourselves right now. So, Lord, I, I just pray. Lord, I'm so frustrated with where we are right now as a culture and what's happening in our world. And yet, God, in your divine purposes, this is where we find ourselves. And so, Lord, um, help us to be people of grace and humility and courage. God, that, that, Lord, those of us who would be so upset during a time like this, if the tides were turned and this actually became persecution, Lord, I pray we would be just as eager to flood the church as it is when we're saying we wish this wasn't happening during a time of pestilence. Make us eager to meet in the face of places where the government would command us to do something that you forbid or forbid us to do something that you would command. Give us courage for that. But for everything else, God, give us mercy, give us charity, give us grace, we pray. We love you, we thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Well, listen, uh, again, if you're new today or as I've been preaching this morning, I realize this is not really a gospel message, but I certainly want to give you the opportunity that when Peter says this is how we ought to live, these should be the impulses of the Christian life. The reason those impulses are there is because the Spirit of God is there, and the reason the Spirit of God is there is because we've confessed, we've repented of our sins, we've put our faith, our hope, our trust in Jesus Christ. If you've never done that before, I want to invite you to do that right now. That you would just, you, you, what, what you're doing is you're simply, you're, you're turning away and saying, man, I'm going to put my hope not in my own religiosity, not in my own goodness, not in how, you know, not, not, in, not in other things like the economy or family or whatever. I'm going to look and say, I, I understand that Jesus Christ is my only hope, that I have sinned, that I've fallen short of God's glory. And the only way I can be justified, the only way I can be put into right relationship with him is because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And if you want to make that decision today, then you can pray that to God. God save me. But I would love it if you'd do me a favor. Just dial that or text that number, 626-469-7070, and just say, I want to become a Christian, or I want to be saved, however you want to phrase that, right? And we would love to just be a resource to you, send you a Bible, help you in whatever way that we can, okay? We're going to sing uh, another song. Then I'm going to come up here, so if you want to get your communion elements ready, uh, we will partake of the Lord's Supper together and then uh, we'll finish out that song and be dismissed. All right, let's worship the Lord together. Your blood 
children of God, and one of the things, the thing that binds us together is the gospel of Jesus Christ, his cross, his, his life, his death, his, his resurrection. Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the context of that is the partaking of the Lord's Supper as a body, and to discern that there are other people that aren't like you around you, right? And that we don't just look at this as this is my religion with Jesus. This is about God and me, but God and us. And so one of the things that the gospel should do is bring us together in unity. So we prayed about this in the beginning. We've talked about where some of our differences might lie, even with respect to this. And now we come back to the cross of Jesus that, that reminds us of the unity that we have in him. And so Paul goes on to say, look, let Let's talk about this. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And having blessed it, he said, this is my body, broken for you all, right? This is, this is for us. So let's partake of the body of Christ. same manner after he had taken the bread he took the cup and says this is my blood this is the new covenant my blood was poured out for you as often as you eat the bread and you drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes he's saying to these Corinthians he's saying to us like remember how Jesus laid down his life laid down his rights laid down his privileges for us Let's do this for one another. So as we partake of this, let's remember our brothers and sisters, those that we differ with. Say, God, give us an attitude that's willing to be forgiving, merciful, gracious, sacrificial toward them, and humble. Let's partake together. So Father, I pray that you do that. I pray that what would unite us is not our reaction to COVID, what would unite us is not our political leanings, would not be socioeconomic status or ethnicity. It would be this fact that we have been born again into a family and your blood now flows through our veins. We are different because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' name.
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. That's who we are. And uh, let's uh, let 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 be our benediction. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. We love you guys. Uh, we're praying for you and we can't wait to see you again. In the meantime, go in the grace of God. We'll see you in classes this week, and uh, if not, then we'll see you at church next week. Love you guys.